One part of the overall mission of the International Space Station is to serve as a platform from which to study the Earth. And what advantage the complex has over automated instruments and other satellites is the presence of human crew members armed with cameras and curiosity. Recently, my colleague Amiko Cowderer talked with Dr. Lisa Vanderblumen, the manager of the Earth Science and Remote Sensing Unit here at the Johnson Space Center, about the Crew Earth Observation Experiment, and asked her to explain why it helps to have humans in the loop. Well, because you have human in, in involvement during the whole process, and that means it, we can uh, get dynamic shots from uh, the ISS, and it allows for uh, immediate types of responses. Sometimes we have a lot of dynamic events. Uh, we also have IDC events, which are international disaster charter events, and they happen uh, in an instant, basically. And so having astronauts that can immediately take these pictures for us uh, prevents us from having to actually task satellites, uh, which is a time-consuming uh, uh, matter. So that's one of the main reasons. Also, um, the public loves the human involvement in these pictures. So uh, getting the public involved and seeing these pictures really helps our program and uh, helps the, um, the whole ISS program. Well, let's talk about crew at the observations. Can you describe for me what the goals are and also how does it work? Sure. Uh, Crew Earth Observations, also commonly known as CEO, has been around since the beginning of the shuttle days. And the reason that it was developed or, or came about basically is to help the astronauts capture the photos while they're in space. And so we have a group here now of Earth scientists and educators, uh, very knowledgeable that actually um, we, get, we receive a lot of different requests from different parties, educators, scientists, even the crew themselves have uh, certain sites that they like to see. So we get those list of, of targets. We use a very complicated software package to actually determine what targets are, are, are viable, if you will, for the next day. And that's based on the position of the ISS, based on uh, weather conditions and so forth. And so we generate a list. We then send that up to the to the crew on the ISS for them to try to uh, obtain these, these photos. And it's our help that uh, we also give them guidance on how to take the photos and so forth. Great. Can you give me some examples of pictures that serve the goal of uh, documenting the impact of uh, humans on their planet? Sure. I think the next shot that you'll see right here, this is, uh, most po people probably remember this pretty well. This is the BP oil spill uh, back in 2010, April of 2010. And right there, you'll see the oil slick in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, very, very uh, dis disastrous event, if people remember those years ago. And what you're seeing here, again, is the oil slick uh, on the surface. And uh, during this event, the oil leaked out from the rig. Uh, and here's an, a follow-on here. Uh, and this image, if you look to the left there, you'll see actually the uh, Mississippi Delta there. And again, you're seeing the huge expanse of this oil slick. There were approximately 60 8,000, if you will, square miles of ocean that were covered uh, by the oil or affected by the oil. It's not only the surface, but also the deeper depths. Depth. And uh, again, another view here and there at the top of this image, you'll see the, the uh, Mississippi Delta as well. The Delta, the Mississippi strong flows also impacted the spread of this oil spill. Very disastrous on all the, of the different life in this environment. Even today, in April, in this month, basically 2016, a study was recently done where 88% of 360 of um, uh, small dolphins actually had underdeveloped lungs, uh, and they attributed that to the oil. This next image is actually Chicago at night, and this was a study, uh, is part of a study that the researchers are actually looking at light pollution levels, and they want to take that information across the city, this city in particular, and actually take it back to the laboratory and test those light levels on mice in a laboratory setting to see what the biological effects are. What about 
monitoring natural disasters. That's a big part of what we do in our group. And the next photo that you'll see, um, this is actually uh, flooding in the uh, Amur River in Russia. And to the left there on the bank of, the, you see the sediment, the reddish sediment flow. It's a very intense, very large sediment plume due to the flooding. And the, on to the left of the, the bank of that river is the city uh, Troiskoy, uh, which is obviously going to be impacted by the flooding, as well as the agricultural fields to the left as well. So a very uh, disaster, uh, disastrous area at that time. And this was back in 2013. And the next image you'll see there, this is uh, in New South Wales, uh, uh, Australia, excuse me. And this is uh, October of 2013. And what you see there are intense wildfires. There were about 100 wildfires at that time. And that was due to very high temperatures and very windy conditions. And you can see this, in, this astronaut photo shows the extent quite well. Here's the same area at nighttime. You can see the fires lit up quite well. So again, very, very good image of the type of uh, disastrous event that was occurring at this time. And here's another image. This is uh, one of the things that our astronauts like to take uh, are images of tropical cyclones and hurricanes. This is Hurricane Olaf back in October of 2015. And uh, the reason this we picked this one basically to show is that this was part of a project that we're working with, Tropical Cyclone Project, where they're trying to actually learn more about the eye and the actual eye wall. They're taking measurements of these types of photos that are taken on a regular basis by the crew to actually determine the altitude of the clouds in the eye wall. And that will help with learning more and getting a better idea of the intensity of storms and actually the paths that storms will take. And here's uh, one other flooding example. And this was the Shire River in Mozambique. And this was in January of last year, 2015. And once again, if you see the, the uh, city to the top of this image, and that's uh, Sanjay. And again, very likely to be impacted by the flooding here. There's also an airport, if you look to the very top as well, that could also be impacted by this flooding. So I understand we can take these photographs and then also uh, stitch them together into video. Can you tell me about that? Yes, we can. That's, that's a project that we really enjoy doing. Our staff really enjoys that. So the next video that you're going to see is actually a video of, at night going across Africa from the northwest uh, portion of the continent down to the southeast. And here you see, uh, and also in the background there, which is beautiful, is the Milky Way that shows in the background there. We're going across now the Sahara, Sahara Desert as the ISS passes over continuing on towards the southeast. Uh, now we're at the Democratic P Republic of the Congo, and continuing on more smaller cities throughout the continent. And here we have Harare, Zimbabwe, and Pretoria, South Africa, now at the very end of this video. Does uh, taking pictures of Earth become valuable to the astronauts themselves? Oh, definitely. Um, one of our jobs that we really enjoy, or the parts of our jobs that we really enjoy, is our ability to actually interview and talk with the astronauts, both before they go up uh, into space and also when they return uh, during debriefs. And a constant theme that we hear from them is how much they enjoy taking pictures. They enjoy taking the time to pick up a camera, go to the window, and take pictures for us. Um, and it's a, it's a real challenge sometimes for them and we help them through it, but um, I think it's really very relaxing and therapeutic for them. I would imagine in some ways a way of connecting back to Earth when you're so isolated in a way. Exactly. exactly. And another fact that we hear from a lot of astronauts is that they have a hard time expressing what they see up there to the rest of the world. So by capturing their views and pictures in these, in these gorgeous images, it does justice to actually letting the rest of the public know what they what they have been witnessing. Absolutely. And and mentioning letting the rest of the public, you know, being able to see those uh, those images that the astronauts do take. Right. These images are posted online that anyone can access anywhere. Can you tell me about, well, first of all, I guess, can you tell me where these are located? Sure. Um, we have a website. Uh, it's called the Gateway to Astronaut Photography of Earth, and it's called the, the GAPE, G-A-P-E. And we recently, about a year and a half ago, did a, a major overhaul of the website, made it more modern and uh, very good search utilities and so forth. And right now, uh, we, if you look at the average number of hits on that website for the last three months of this year, it's about 40, 40 million hits per month, and that's huge. Um, and we're, we've been told that we are one of the most popular sites 
uh, within NASA. Uh, so we get a huge number of individuals, groups, and so forth coming to the site, searching our photos, requesting photos, and so forth. That's uh, really great news to know that we have that uh, capability to be able to access these photographs. Um, a lot of people are already accessing it, but if they are not, go to that website yep. again. Is GAPE, Gateway to Astronaut Photography of Earth. If you type that into Google, you will find it. Great. Thanks so much for coming here and talking with us today. Sure. Again, that was uh, Lisa Vanderblumen here at the NASA Johnson Space Center.